Hello, everyone, and welcome to our FreedomWorks uh, Supply Chain and Inflation webinar. Uh, tonight, we will be discussing um, what caused the problems and what are the solutions. And so I want to begin uh, by introducing uh, Killian uh, Laverty to our, um, did I get that right, Killian? You did. Okay, wonderful. Um, from our policy team, who will be doing an introduction as to, um, as to how we got to this problem uh, where we have $5 gasoline across the nation um, and supply chain disruptions all over the place. So Killian, please take it away. Yeah, definitely. Hi, I'm Killian Laverty from uh, the FreedomWorks policy team. So I'm gonna do a brief presentation here on what is inflation and uh, how we got here. So let me share my screen and give me one moment. There we go. Awesome. So. What is inflation? Well, at its core, inflation is a decline in purchasing power over a currency, and this can take a variety of forms, but the two ways we measure it is in CPI and PPI. So this is the consumer price index and the producer price index that measure or measure retail and wholesale inflation. So this can take a variety of uh, shapes and forms. So there's cost push inflation, uh, demand caused inflation, as well as those with public policy or public policy caused inflation. So in the cost side, this is when just something that is produced costs more, it could be because of a drought or be because of new taxes or regulatory compliance. Demand is when you have something that suddenly has a, has a high or a raise in demand. So one good way to think about it is maybe a sports ticket where the New York Giants over the past season were struggling. So less fans were watching them and the, the, the price of the tickets dropped, say the, the next season, Suddenly, the, the team turns back to their championship ways, and you have a higher demand of, uh, of tickets to be bought. The price is going to go back up. Finally, we have public policy. So this can take the form of both fiscal and monetary, monetary policy. So fiscal is budget and spending, how much we take in in taxes and how much the Congress spends. And then we have monetary, which is the, the policy surrounding the dollar. This is like what the Federal Reserve does. So by the numbers right now, consumer uh, price index is at about 8.6% inflation for all goods. So from May 2022 to May 2021, we saw an 8.6% jump in prices for the average of all goods. Now, in particular, two of the, the biggest areas that people have seen hurt in their pockets have been in energy and food, so everything from gas to groceries. So we've seen in energy commodities, a 50.3% spike in the, the uh, consumer price index. So this would be crude oil, heating oil, natural gas, gasoline, and then a 10.1% jump in, uh, in food. Now, producer price index is up to 10.8%. To and this is a relation between the two of a, of a leading cause. So as producer price index increases, we can assume that consumer price index will follow. So that is not good. And then <clears throat> what caused this? Well, hmm. during the COVID-19 pandemic, we had $6 trillion spent by Congress that frankly we don't have. It's a, it's a part of the, the Congress's deficit spending binge and $7.1 trillion pumped into the economy from the uh, Federal Reserve, along with the, the consequences of disastrous lockdown policies destroying supply chains. So a couple graphs we have here is we can see the United States budget deficit over the past 20 or so years. And you can see both parties spending way more money than we have, way more money than we take in, blowing up the federal debt to now above $30 trillion. And we can see a giant spike over the past couple of years in uh, COVID spending past 2020. So as the Biden administration claims that they're, they're cutting federal deficit, well, we can see it wasn't that hard to begin with. And even with the, the supposed claim, they're not even reaching the, the, the levels of federal deficit that we saw in 2019 pre-pandemic. Now the Federal Reserve, which controls monetary policy, so this is the dollars that are in circulation has three main tools that they use to, to influence um, monetary policy. They're setting reserve requirements, so how many dollars banks have to have on hand, setting interest rates, how easy it is to spend money or loan money, I should say, 
And finally, open market operations, which is the buying and selling of assets. So over the past uh, uh, 20 years, excuse me, uh, 10 years or so since the, the recession in 2008, we saw a giant spike in the amount of assets bought by the Federal Reserve. So this is how they pump money into the economy. Uh, they, they do print dollars, but most of it is digital through buying uh, and selling government bonds. And we can see in uh, 2020, a giant, a giant spike again. And I should say that this graph is taken directly from the Federal Reserve's website earlier today. And it's a bit misleading because it says M on the side. So you think million, but actually it's million, million. So right now, the which is a trillion. So right now the Federal Reserve has approximately $9 trillion worth of assets on its balance sheet, which is uh, more than, or almost a 900% increase from its 2008 levels. And this is all part of what's known as modern monetary theory. The idea that powerhouse nations that have giant economies and control their own fiat currency, which means it's not backed by anything, deficits don't matter to them. And they can spend however money they so please, whether or not they have it. And this is a, a theory that even current Biden administration, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has, has condemned now that she's actually recognizing inflation is a thing uh, as leading to, 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 in some cases, hyperinflation is the quote here on the slide. Meanwhile, the Biden administration is undergoing an America last energy policy, shutting down the Keystone XL pipeline, placing a moratorium on new oil and gas leases on federal lands. And rather than removing barriers at home and encouraging domestic energy production, they're going to foreign oil coast cartels like OPEC and begging them to, to produce more oil rather than doing it here at home. And finally, we've got we're finally seeing the consequences, not only of the, the spending binge that Congress has been on, especially in the past couple of years, but through the past couple of decades as well, through both parties. Um, we're seeing not only those consequences, but also the, the consequences of disastrous COVID-19 lockdowns, which shut down major sectors of the economy most states went through with and um, disrupted supply chains. So now producers are struggling to, to reach supply of pre-pandemic levels. And with that, I'm going to kick it over to the reason we're all here, and that is to uh, hear from Congressman Thomas Massey and Chip Roy. And of course, moderating it, we'll have uh, Spencer Critian, who is the Director of Programs here at FreedomWorks and is a veteran of the Trump White House. Well, thank you, Killian, and thank you so much to everybody for joining us this evening. Um, thank you to the panelists we have. We're so pleased to have you all. Um, if you have any questions throughout the course of the panel, please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom right of your Zoom, and uh, we will um, get those questions answered. Um, as Killian mentioned, I'm Spencer Cradian, Director of Programs at FreedomWorks, and I'm really pleased to be able to introduce our two panelists, uh, Congressman Chip Roy and Congressman Thomas Massey. Uh, Representative Roy represents the 21st District of Texas and was first elected in 2018. Representative Massey represents the 4th District of Kentucky, and he was elected for the first time in 2012. They're great friends of FreedomWorks and uh, some of the, the real strong allies that we have on Capitol Hill. Um, so I want to begin by, by asking both of you, you know, here in the D.C. bubble, we, uh, we hear a lot of talk about inflation and, um, and it's, it's a lot of it is, uh, is theoretical and involves a lot of numbers. But I'm wondering uh, to the, the folks on the panel, do you have any stories of your home districts in America um, that are particularly relevant, uh, that, that are examples of what this inflation and these supply chain problems are causing in the lives of the average American? Um, feel free to, to jump in, either of you. Well, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I'll just say that, you know, uh, part of my district is very rural and part of it's sort of suburban and suburban, uh, suburban and urban near Cincinnati. And a lot of my constituents drive 50 miles to work. And so when they see $5 a gallon gasoline, it's, we're not California where it's $6, we're in Kentucky and it's five dollars i don't know what it is in texas chip but either wherever you are you're not going to escape inflation 
because this is a federal phenomenon. And um, what it means to my constituents is the price of fuel comes directly out of their paycheck because they have to get to work and a lot of them drive more than 30 miles to get to work. And then when they get home, they bring the paycheck home, they have to buy groceries. And those groceries have traveled on a truck where the, the diesel is selling for $6 a gallon in Kentucky. And so we're seeing massive inflation here in Kentucky. And I predicted this in, on March 27th, 2020. I know Chip Roy was uh, predicting it with me that if we spend, at that time, by the way, it was Republicans and Democrats. They didn't want to go on the record. Um, I came to D.C. and I made them take a freaking vote on this because I knew this was going to happen. They knew it was going to happen. They didn't want to go on record. I wasn't able to force them to go on record, but I was able to force them to actually vote. And um, now you're seeing what we, the consequence of that, massive inflation. That was the first $2 trillion. There was another $2 trillion spent, that, spent since then, and then another $2 trillion after that. Killian did a great job of showing how the Federal Reserve balance sheet went up. There wasn't six, you know, Chip and I used to bemoan the fact that, you know, we had spent $24 trillion, or $24 trillion we didn't have and we had borrowed it. But you know, two years ago, there wasn't another $6 trillion to borrow. It wasn't like it was sitting around and we could borrow it. If you took all the savings and of the corporations and the, and the personal accounts, it didn't amount to that. So what they did is they printed it, and they printed it at the Treasury, and the, uh, they issued you know, uh, securities. And so the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve is, is, uh, went up $6 trillion, basically, in this period of time. It looks like the debt went up $6 trillion, too. But the difference this time, instead of the debt just going up $6 trillion, they injected $6 trillion into the money supply. And that's why you're seeing all these consequences. And I'll turn it over to Chip Roy, who is uh, undoubtedly one of my favorites, definitely my favorite from, t from Texas, and a good freedom fighter here. Well, uh, <clears throat> look, I mean, people ask me who I, who I align with in the House of Representatives, and it's always uh, an easy answer for me and Thomas Massey, um, and I'm honored to serve with him. And, and uh, you know, there aren't many people that I look to the board to see how, how they're voting to check my vote against, but Thomas is one of them, <laughs> uh, just to make sure we're holding each other accountable. Um, but look, Tom, I can't add too much to what Thomas just said. I was just saying, Texas, you asked how it's impacting people. My parents are going through building a house right now uh, in Blanco, Texas, which is uh, in the heart of the, the district I represent, North San Antonio. And I mean, they're having all sorts of supply chain issues, right? In terms of whether it's labor, whether it's supplies, whether it's appliances. Uh, just recently, they couldn't even get concrete. I mean, they, all of the stuff that they need, um, they were struggling with. Every restaurant I talked to, struggling. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I could go down the list of things we're dealing with and it's real uh, and it's having a major impact on on uh, our constituents. And importantly, <clears throat> we all know why this is happening. I mean, it's a totally avoidable uh, situation uh, that was caused all at the root, as Thomas just outlined, what we knew was going to happen in the March of 20. When you go dump at that point, two trillion and then, you know, three, four five trillion just kept you know flowing out. And um we knew what that was going to happen and they did it anyway. Um, you know, you might've been able to survive, uh, you know, an early pop and then stop, but, the, the, but even that was egregious. And Thomas was hundred percent right to go to Washington and object. And um, I mean, he, you know, uh, Washington never, never uh, finds a spending bill. They're not willing to go uh, jump aboard and, and support uh, whether it's a $2 trillion bill that Thomas is trying to simply demand of yays and nays on or a $19 billion emergency bill that I was trying to stop a couple of years ago. Uh, we just passed a water, you know, resources, Borda bill, so-called last week on, you know, $40 billion. Uh, they're now working. I mean, all of these things are things that Washington just puts in the automatic pipeline. Now, the reason I'm bringing that up, I just left a dinner with a number of my colleagues kind of ranging the, the ideological spectrum in the party. And I was with some folks from the Heritage Foundation uh, and Steve Moore, who, you know, worked in the Trump administration, an economist. And I asked Steve this question about the spending because everybody, we were talking about oil and gas, we were talking about uh, regs, all of which I agree are fundamental to this problem. But I said, if, do you have any belief that Republicans are going to get religion on spending and stop dumping all of this money and continue to keep dumping all this money into the economy? 
uh, even on top of the COVID money. And, and Steve was like, well, you know, there's no indication that that's the case. And Thomas and I are fighting that every single day. And thank you to Freedom Works for helping us try to hold the line and, you know, check the profligate spending in Washington. Because uh, even if we go open up oil, American oil and gas, which is a battle and all this whole CO2 worshiping stuff, or even if we go, uh, you know, you know, get rid of some of the regulations, we're still going to be battling the fact that Washington has a profligate spending problem and it's impacting real people. My parents, I can just say right front and center right now, they just had to eat another 20,000 bucks on the top of a of a price of their house, which is a lot for the value of the house they're trying to build. And and it's it's hurting them as a retired couple trying to figure out how to, um, you know, uh, afford their housing. If I could just punctuate something Chip said, Washington does have a spending problem. And it used to be a borrowing and a spending problem. Now it's a printing, printing. And a spending yeah. problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's uh, those are really uh, important points and important stories. And, you know, we hear activists all the time who who are struggling to to make ends meet thanks to this this inflation and these supply chain problems. My next question uh, is is directed at uh, Representative Massey, and that is, um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your bill called the Prime Act, <laughs> I was how it could help, ask. how it could help with some uh, supply chain disruptions that Americans are seeing in the meatpacking industry and and agriculture. We well, and Thomas, Thomas, who was one of your first co-sponsors? I think Chip Roy <laughs> was one of my first co-sponsors. And, and, and Chip Roy's kind of a cowboy, but he doesn't have any cattle, so I got to give him credit. <laughs> Uh, but uh, he understood this problem. He knows what this problem is. Uh, and, and I've been talking about this since 2015, and FreedomWorks has been promoting this bill since then because they knew the problem too. For, we, you know, we talk about Russian oligarchs and the Chinese communists, central planning, but in the United States, we have four meat packers who control 85% of the market of all the meat that's processed in the United States. And I think your uh, FreedomWorks listeners might be shocked to find out that one of those is wholly owned by the Chinese operating in the United States. The other is wholly owned by Brazilians operating in the United States. The other two are sort of multinational companies. Um, and the problem is they have achieved a sort of market dominance, not through being better than everybody else, but because of government regulation. We have over-regulated meat processing in the United States. You can drive past a farmer's field and you can see cattle there, and the farmer is selling those cattle at like a quarter of what you're paying for beef in the supermarket. And the difference is this oligopoly that we've enabled. So my Prime Act, basically what it says is, return the power back to the states. If you've got a, a, a farmer and a meat processor and a grocery store and a consumer uh, who are all located in one state and you're not engaged in interstate commerce, then get the USDA the hell out of that uh, transaction. Get, get them off our farms, get them out of our processing plants. Yes, you know, we, we have health inspections. Uh, those happen at the county level. All states have their own, you know, food laws. Don't bring the USDA into this because they are the ones who have uh, caused this crisis. They've enabled the oligopoly that exists in the United States. So, the, the, and by the way, we've got, I mean, I, sometimes I, I worry about advertising this on FreedomWorks, but I've got Democrat co-sponsors on this bill in the House and in the Senate because it's the one area. Everybody has to eat food. Everybody's getting impacted in the supermarket. Everybody has farmers who are going broke and going into bankruptcy. And everybody's seeing shortages in the supermarket. This bill solves those problems, not by spending government money, by, but by lifting off the brakes and getting out of the way. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that uh, explanation, Congressman, and certainly is, is more relevant now than ever. You know, we've seen the benefits of deregulation in other industries, airlines, telecommunications, trucking, um, and, uh, you know, it, it would have the same effect in, in agriculture. Uh, next, I have a question uh, for, for Representative Roy, and that is, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about your uh, discharge petition for the Protecting American Energy Jobs Act and the damage that has been caused more generally um, by President Biden's uh, energy policies. Yeah, happy to. And and uh, you know, I, I was joking. I was a uh, co-sponsor of that bill, but I'm a proud co-sponsor of that bill. It's a great bill that Thomas has offered, and it does have bipartisan support for a reason. I did grow up raising cattle. Uh, I do have I have I have ten acres in Texas. He is correct. I don't currently have cattle, 
Although we may be changing that soon. I got to get a fence built. Some. I got to get a fence some. built on one side of my, on my property, uh, which is a little harder to do in the limestone of central Texas than it is in the uh, hills of Kentucky, I think. So um, mm. if my experience in Virginia, I think was similar, we, you, you could dig a post hole anywhere, but in any event, um, I, uh, you know, look on the energy front, uh, we talked, we've talked about spending, but I mean, energy is a, if not, um, it may be the biggest driver right now of what we're dealing with in terms of price of goods and services. And it's absolutely absurd. I mean, I live in Texas, uh, Thomas lives in Kentucky, right? Where we've got coal, we've got oil, we've got, we've got the ability to be, and we had the ability and were, uh, energy independent and had the ability to produce mountains of, um, you know, oil and gas and uh, coal to be able to power energy. And here I am sitting in Texas and we've got warnings for blackouts and warnings that we're not gonna have energy because why? Well, about a month ago, we had a pretty windless week and the portion of our grid that is wind, which is about 20% of our grid, only had 17% production. Why? Well, it was windless. We've already said when you have a windless cloudy day uh, or cloud, you know, uh, that you're going to have a problem. And this is what we're facing now with our grids and what we're facing with our energy situation. It's also what we're feel, dealing now in terms of our gasoline and why Thomas asked how much is in Texas. It's about 450, 460, uh, depending on what station I go to, 469. Um, and that's absurd. I'm in Texas. And, uh, you know, we've got the president of the United States now going and begging Saudi Arabia for, you know, access to their oil when we could be producing it. So yeah, about 15 months ago, um, I did a discharge petition, which for your your uh, very educated viewers, and, and I think they probably know this heavily, it's a way for us to try to force action on the floor of the House of Representatives when the speaker and the majority party uh, refuse. So if we can get 218 signatures, we can move a bill. Um, so we've got a discharge petition to move uh, my friend Lauren Boebert from Colorado her legislation to free up oil and gas on federal lands, uh, uh, offshore and uh, the Gulf, to open up the pipelines that the administration have been clamping down on, such as the Keystone Pipeline and other pipelines. You saw recently the uh, clamping down of the ability to explore in Alaska. Uh, it's absolutely absurd that we're not able to take advantage of the great abundant resources we have in this country. I would point out that we currently have about 11 million uh, barrels of, of oil that we're, we're that we're producing as compared to probably about 15 million when we were at the uh, uh, peak under President Trump. Uh, that is a massive delta. And you want to know why we're having problems. There's your there's your answer. And uh, we could change that if you didn't have an administration going to war with the industry that can produce the lifeblood for us to have abundant energy. One final point. When everybody's all wailing about on the left about CO2 and about, oh, we've, we've got to do all this. First of all, CO2 is good for our, our, our uh, climate and for our um, world, but that's a different conversation. Even if you hate CO2, oddly, you know, since we, you know, produce it and plants use it to breathe uh, or to, to, to uh, uh, you know, produce oxygen for us to use. Uh, and food. E and food. Even if you accept the absurdity of wanting to go to war with CO2, China has 1,100 coal-fired plants and are building one new coal-fired plant per week. I mean, they are absolutely chugging along to build their economy while we are building an energy uh, uh, system built on the back of solar, which I'm, I'm fine having. I mean, look, Thomas is off the grid. He's got great solar. Good. That's awesome. But they want to convert our entire energy system to solar and wind. So we're beholden to China instead of being able to produce abundant oil and gas, abundant energy here in this country. Uh, China has 150 nuclear plants in the pipeline. We have zero. Basically, I think we have like one in Georgia and one other that's that's in the process. So uh, we need to open that up. And that's the point of that discharge petition. Great. Well, th that's very helpful. Um, my next question is, you know, oversight of the Biden administration is going to be obviously a priority uh, if and when Republicans take control of the House this November. Um, but what should what are some tangible uh, parts of that strategy? What should they be with respect uh, to things like inflation and supply chains? What what can you all do in the majority uh, to at least provide oversight of what's going on? I, I just want to say quickly that uh, Chip Roy and I served together on the Oversight Committee, and now we serve together on the Judiciary Committee. 
And uh, the, the oversight there is going to be great because Jim Jordan is going to be the chairman, presumably, if we take the majority. He is, I think he's going to be the best chairman in Congress. He's going to be the most conservative chairman. <laughs> yeah. And I know I've just ticked off a lot of chairmen right now, but <laughs> I don't care. And Chip Roy doesn't care either. But oh. uh, we're, we're going to have in that committee oversight over the DOJ, the FBI, the ATF, uh, the court system. And that's going to be really critical because we've seen uh, people going to school boards being targeted. Uh, we've got immigration oversight in, in that committee. Uh, we've seen the ATF shutting down gun dealers. We've seen uh, the Merrick Garland, the attorney general, who refused to answer my question when I asked him how many FBI, well, not FBI, but how many assets or agents of the federal government were present and agitating on January 5th and January 6th to get the protesters to enter the Capitol. By the way, not a conspiracy theory, completely legitimate question based on what we saw in the uh, Governor Whitmer kidnapping plot where most of the co-conspirators were actually working for the FBI. Uh, the, you know, and Merrick Garland refused to answer my question. That's not going to be happening when we're in the majority, I hope. I, and, and I think Chip, you know, would agree with me. If I, I think every time they refuse to answer a question, don't rely on the DOJ to police the DOJ and re reference a contempt case or whatever. Just cut their funding. Every take one percent out of the FBI every time they lie to us or quit or, or won't answer a question. They would be here the next day begging to answer our questions. Yeah, can I again? I want to uh, echo that. Uh, 100 percent everything Thomas just said on the oversight on those particular areas in, in judiciary. If you're on the oversight committee or frankly any of the committee's jurisdiction, uh, we need to have significant oversight to, to expose to the American people what this administration is actually doing to them. This administration is <clears throat> openly, for people who pay attention, uh, at war with the people of the United States when we could have much more affordable energy, much more affordable goods and services, a much stronger economy, a much better position in the world in terms of our, our, our national security, if we were doing the opposite of what this administration is doing. You set out to harm America. I'm not sure what you would do differently than what this administration is doing. And we need to expose that. We need to expose it on a daily basis when we're in the majority. Uh, and I agree with Thomas, but, but the most important thing Thomas said is defunding tyranny, defunding the bureaucracy, defunding the administration that's at war with the American people. Why are we writing a blank check to the Department of Justice to then turn around and have them target parents, target parents for simply raising questions at school boards? Why are we funding a DHS that refuses to secure the border? Why are we funding a blank check, $40 billion to Ukraine, while we're creating the very environment for Russia to thrive and harming our own oil and gas supply with no actual a strategy about what we're trying to do with that $40 billion. Why, into the case of what we're talking about with inflation, why are we not, why are we just doling out money to the Department of Energy, to the Department of Interior, while they are clamping down on the ability of the American people to carry out their business and go produce energy? It is unconscionable. There's never been a stupider group of human beings than the people running this country right now. When you, when you, when you take into account the strength this country has at its core, the American people and the resources God blessed us with, and the fact that we're literally just lighting that on fire and turning over all our power to China, Saudi Arabia, Iran, our enemies, and uh, and then you know destroying the economy for the American people by spending $5 trillion and shutting down our economy while shutting down our oil and gas. You can't even make up how absurd it is what's happening, and we need to have oversight on that. Absolutely. Uh, we heard a little bit earlier uh, about about a conversation that you were having, Representative Roy, with with uh, with our colleague Steve Moore. But I'm wondering, um, you know, how much confidence should we have in the Republican leadership to conduct that oversight uh, and to address the root causes of inflation, which are mostly federal government spending, uh, you know, and a lot of these um, a lot of these spending bills have broad bipartisan support. Should we should we put our faith uh, in in leadership? How how should we navigate that that terrain when it comes to you know a potential majority? Well, in America, we put our faith in principles, not in princes. Uh, otherwise, you will always be disappointed. Um, <laughs> yeah. And that th thus it always should be. Uh, and that includes, with all due respect, me and Thomas. Right? I mean, we we as a people 
have to stand up for limited government, for the Constitution, for our rights, for our rights given to us by God. And we have to fight for those at all times, whether it's the gun uh, situation that we're dealing with now, where it's purposeful effort to defund uh, the people because that's what tyrants like to do, or whether it's the economic situation. And the question you're asking about was spending. Um, no, I don't have a whole lot of faith right now that that Republican leadership has given any indication right now whatsoever that they believe in taking the steps necessary to constrain Leviathan, restrict the growth of government, be responsible in spending. Uh, I mean, it's like pulling teeth right now to force us to be able to have a week to review suspension bills that are 10, 20, 50 million dollars, whatever they might be. Uh, because, oh, no, don't rock the boat in this town. we got a steak dinner we got to go to. So for us to win this fight, the American people, the great people of Freedom Works, are going to have to light a fire under uh, our representatives to do the right thing. And we know what the right thing to do is if we get in power. We should, you know, actually uh, responsibly uh, work towards a balanced budget. I mean, Rand has got good ideas about how to deal with things. It's not the penny plan anymore because we've screwed everything up so bad. Plan. It can't be the penny plan anymore. But the nickel there, plan. Yeah, it's, I think it's the nickel plan now. Uh, but, you know, you joke when when I first went to Washington as, as a staffer eons ago, uh, the debt was something like six trillion or something. And we're at 30 and that was in 2003. It's 30 and a half trillion dollars. If you want to count to 30 and a half trillion and you do it one Mississippi, 967 thousand years. You'll be sitting here counting to get to thirty and a half trillion dollars, and there's no foot on the brakes. Look, we have to force our Republican leaders to do the right thing, but the people are the only ones who can do it. Because we saw that after the Tea Party in 2010. It takes the people demanding it to get it done. Thomas, you wanted to say something? Yeah, it, and it takes somebody like Chip Roy who will demand a recorded vote. And <laughs> and, um, and, and Mass. Chip Chip's got to, well, I haven't had a chance in like 18 months to demand a recorded <laughs> vote because Chip Roy is camped out on the floor doing this every freaking day. But that's so important because the activists can't know who the good guys are and the bad guys are unless we put them all on record. So my hat is off to Chip Roy. Spencer, you asked about how much confidence should we have in Republicans. And I saw one of these comments pop up on the screen. <laughs> also, I can see some of the comments. They actually show up in front of Chip Roy's face. So yeah, I don't mind. That's good, that's good, it covers me up. Uh, send more comments. But the biggest thing that we could do, and, and this is what I'm watching for, is pass individual spending bills instead of one giant omnibus. Because here's the argument that they're going to make to all the, all the freshmen who come in in this wave election, and all the freshmen who came in, in in 2022, and all the freshmen who came in in 2020. By the way, all of them have never been in the majority and they've never seen what it's like to be screamed at because you voted no. Like, oh it's God. cool to vote no now. Everybody's got a good freedom work score if you're a Republican. But when we get in the majority, it's going to be tough. And the way you sort the wheat from the chaff, and, and I'm going to be honest with you, not all of my colleagues are like Chip Roy. They're not going to be strong. They're going to get weak need. They're, they're going to get soft <laughs> when push comes to shove. And so here's how you deal with that. We need to send individual spending bills, not a giant omnibus, 12 separate bills. Let's fund the national parks and NASA. Let's fund the roads and bridges. Let's fund the court system. Let's send that money, those checks to Joe Biden. He can decide to sign those or not sign those. And then when we get to the big fights on the border or the ATF or the FBI, those will be individual bills. They, we won't send a bill to Joe Biden, that we shouldn't send a bill to Joe Biden that funds it all or nothing because we will get blamed for the shutdown. Now, Chip Roy and I, we don't care if we get blamed for a shutdown, but right. we've got colleagues who mean well, who uh, d don't have the backbone of Chip Roy. Maybe they've got a district that's harder to win and they're, they're trying to sort of, you know, thread the needle. Well, though, whoever it is, whether you're in a strong district or not, you need to be, have accountability and you need to have the ability to vote on these individual spending bills. And that way we don't, when somebody says, oh, we don't get it blamed for a shutdown, that's a false choice between funding everything and funding nothing. Let's fund all the stuff that we agree with, send that to Joe Biden. If he vetoes it, he's responsible for shutting down the national park because that was an individual bill. 
And that's the best way to victory while, the, while we're in the majority and Joe Biden's still president. Because here's the other argument they're going to make. Because I was here when uh, Obama was president and we were in the majority and we had the power to do something, but our leadership talked too many of my colleagues out of it by saying, it's not about you, we gotta win the White House. You can't get anything done unless you win the White House, so don't do any drama, calm your, you know, cool your jets, calm down and vote for the Republican omnibus and then we'll win the White House and then we can do something. That's a lie. Don't fall for it. If any of my colleagues were watching this, I would say don't fall for it. But the FreedomWorks uh, listeners and the FreedomWorks members are intelligent people who understand exactly what Chip and I are saying. And they can convey that to their members of Congress who might not be as erudite on uh, policy and procedure in Congress. <laughs> Absolutely. If I, if I, if I can ahead. add one more thing, yeah. is that what Thomas just said that I think is critically important um, you know, about this point about, well, when we have the White House, like, so let's fast forward to January, assume the American people give us the majority in the House. I never assume anything, but let's just assume that for the purpose of this conversation, even the Senate by a seat or two, every single, the, the arguments will be immediate. It'll be what Thomas just said. Well, we've got to be smart so we can have the majority and then we can build the White House. We got to, we can't, no, no, don't do any of that crazy stuff. And oh, we don't have 60 votes in the Senate. There's always a reason to do the wrong thing. So our job is to highlight the reasons that doing the right thing actually wins us votes and mobilizes people and win minds and hearts. Right now, we ought to be arguing about the spending stuff Thomas is talking about right now. And but, I, but I promise you, if I said leadership, look, the bill to fund government expires September 30th. Why are we going to continue to fund a DHS that's allowing our borders to be completely overrun and power cartels endanger Texans and allow fentanyl to port our country. And, and they'll say, well, Chip, we can't have a fight about spending in September heading into November. It might cost us seats. Meanwhile, the American people want us to fight. I would argue it costs us seats when they see us not fighting. So we've got to remember that if, if we're blessed with the majority. Absolutely. Yeah, it seems like what we need are uh, reinforcements for you guys, and we need activists across the country to pressure uh, their members to hold their feet to the fire so they can do what they said they will do, unlike in, in 2017 uh, with, with, you know, when, when uh, Congress was not supporting uh, the, the true Trump agenda. Um, one question uh, before we open it up to the, the, the Q&A, um, I wanted to, to ask, you know, uh, Inflation is a national issue. Um, supply chains are, are a national issue. But what are, are you all seeing anything uh, that governors and, and state legislators have done to ease this burden and make make life better? What should what should local and state Republicans, conservatives, uh, whether they're elected officials or activists, what what should they be doing um, to fight this problem at, at that level? So if I Thomas, I, I got Go one. And, and I, I'm just watching with some degree of, of, of awe and certainly respect of what uh, Governor Ron DeSantis has been doing down in Florida. And, uh, you know, I mean, I say that as a proud Texan, but, you know, uh, what, what the governor's been doing is impressive. And, and the issue in particular that I think is really important for free enterprise and capital to flow uh, is the destruction of this ESG woke garbage that's constraining capital, which includes oil and gas. And Governor DeSantis taking on woke ink, right? By going after Disney, by going after those that they'd say are un untouchable. That is an unbelievably important thing to do for the freedom of capital and to make sure that our markets are open and to allow our economy to function. Because again, if government got out of the way, we'd be as strong as we've ever been. And I think we could flip the switch in a matter of months. We would come soaring out of all this uh, if we were just to do that. And so Governor DeSantis taking on that whole issue is a really big deal. I introduced legislation to, uh, uh, you know, prohibit the gov uh, the federal government's um, thrift savings plan, the TSP, from in investing or having any requirements involving ESG. And I think we need to go to war on that stuff. I think we need to win that woke fight in order to free up capital uh, and allow our, our market to catch up and help help consumers. That's one example. That, uh, let me give you another example. Uh, example. There's some states like Wyoming and even Maine who have passed food freedom laws that make it yeah. easier for farmers to get the food directly to consumers. 
without the monopolies of the meat packers and the grocery stores in the middle. Or, I mean, they could sell it directly to the grocery stores and sell it to consumers in those states. At the state level, you can be passing food freedom laws that liberate your states from, uh, you know, these oligopolies that uh, reign nationally, and they're international oligopolies. So that's one thing you could do. We need to erase all the vestiges of COVID tyranny, all the policies that kept businesses shut down. The vaccine mandates need to go. I, you know, I had the nurses organization who, who I've met with for uh, every year that I've been in Congress. I didn't meet with them this year because they have a COVID mandate, like a vaccine mandate. And I've got a policy in my office. We're not meeting with any organization that has a vaccine mandate. Now they were upset about that, but the irony is they wanted to come and talk to me about a nursing shortage. Well, no. maybe you wouldn't have a nursing shortage if you didn't fire people for not taking the vaccine, if you didn't encourage people to change their majors in, in college because they knew they were gonna to have to take the freaking vaccine in order to get a job in nursing. So don't, don't come to me and, and, and lobby me on the nursing shortage because number one, you all did this to yourself, the ones who are in power. There are a lot of great nurses. My mom's a nurse. Uh, but you know the, the organizations, they need to get rid of all the vestiges of COVID tyranny, everything that's holding us back, that's still in place, and then pass these food freedom laws at the state level until we can get it done at the federal level. And as, and, and as uh, my friend Chip Roy said, energy policy and ESG, we can do that also at the state level. If you've got the right governor, man, elect, please elect good governors, good attorneys general, who will yeah. fight back and, and state reps, county commissioners, and school board members. Amen. Amen to all that. And, and he just hit that school board thing at the end. And I realize it's not directly, I think, obviously tied to the economy, but it is, right? I mean, we, we need to go back and take our schools over. I mean, in addition to providing choice and, and so forth, uh, winning at the local level, we won two really important school district seats in the county I uh, live in uh, and represent. Uh, and and it was, they were close elections, but we went in hard because, uh, you know, the, people are tired of this stuff. They, the eyes have been opened up after COVID. They got to see the veil lifted on the corrupt education system that's been corrupting their children. And that's tied to our economy as well and, and our kids. So, um, you know, we're a federalist system. The only thing that's really saving this country right now, and I mean this, uh, besides the, the blessing of the Lord Almighty, is the Second Amendment and federalism. And federalism ain't as strong as it ought to be. And the Second Amendment's under attack. But if we don't have those two things in place, then America would be in a much weaker position as we see all of these countries around the world, Australia, New Zealand, all the places they were locking down and shutting down and, you know, throwing people into, you know, jail and stuff. And, you know, we got to remember what we've got in this country and go preserve and protect it. And by Absolutely. the way, just real quickly, I know we haven't taken questions yet, but I saw one pop up on the screen that I get on Twitter all the time that I, I've, I'm just begging to answer right now. Go ahead. Is, and, and I know this was asked in good faith because these are Freedom Work members, but you know, I called the, the inflation, and Chip did too, a national phenomenon. It's happening across the United States, but it's a global phenomenon. And so I see these woke leftists on Twitter say, oh, Congressman Massey, you're saying it was the spending and the shutdowns in the United States that caused inflation. Well, you must be wrong because it's happened globally. <laughs> but don't point to other countries who did it even worse than us. Right, right. Say, well, they've got inflation too, so the causes you're, you've enumerated aren't valid. No, you, every country you're using to try and disprove actually adds, to the, adds credence to my argument that printing money and shutting down your economy and paying people not to work is going to cause pain and suffering, inflation and shortages. Un unfortunately, Sweden couldn't be the economic engine for the whole world when they had decided to stay open. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, uh, well, thank you both. I mean, that, that's so important. And the, the stuff that you're talking about on ESG and, and school boards, I mean, FreedomWorks has been involved in both of those fights. And um, we are looking forward to continuing that. Uh, the ESG stuff is huge for, for everybody is affected by it in some way. And, and everybody's affected if the schools are, are uh, not teaching what they should be. Uh, Marissa, do you want me to filter uh, to uh, to go through these questions, or do you want to uh, ask the the questions that, that that have been listed in the Q and A? Chip, um, Chip we, and I prefer them unfiltered. 
<laughs> they'll, oh, be unfiltered. they'll be unfiltered okay um sure i will get started um so our first question comes from virginia tucky i hope i'm saying that correctly and her question is mr roy you said these people in government now are stupid don't you think they are doing all of this on purpose to destroy the american principles and institutions so I'm, I'll, I'll answer this quickly, and, and Thomas, and, and for y'all, yeah. I'm going to try to answer these questions quickly so we can go through as many as I can. So for what it's worth, I won't give an extended answer. Uh, the short answer is, uh, it is a mix. There are, There's mm -hmm. some stupidity involved. There's also a great deal of purposeful action, particularly by this administration, frankly, even uh, a number in Congress, uh, it, by design to, uh, you know, take the gun issue, for example, it's purposeful. They're, they want to disarm the people. Uh, Government is strengthened, tyranny is strengthened. Uh, what they're trying to do with the oil and gas situation, it's all about power. All of it's about power. Every bit of this is about power uh, for them to be able to decide what's in our interest. That's what it's about and we need to fight it. That's why we uh, you know, have freedom in this country is to avoid that sort of thing. I'll just say amen to what Chip said and punctuating the oil and gas. A lot of our colleagues would love to see $10 a gallon gasoline. Uh, they have a leftist agenda. I even talked to a Democrat. Uh, you know, walking back from votes, I said, dude, we can debate gun control, we can debate abortion, you can fund Ukraine, we can pass all the bills you want, but you're going to get slaughtered in November over $5 a gallon gasoline. And this Democrat told me, you are right, and I've told my colleagues to lay off the green stuff. What he meant was lay off the Green New Deal, what? because some of them will come out and say out loud what they really mean, which is they want $10 a gallon gasoline. And, and, I, and I'll say I'm, I'm breaking my own rule. We're going long on one question, but but I, keep in I mind, I didn't name Tom, the person. Thomas, <laughs> Thomas, it might be the only member of Congress who's off the grid, right? I mean, the, yeah. this isn't about what we think is good. I'm perfectly fine with these things, but you don't mandate it. You don't create crap right. just because you're chasing the freaking false god of the green left. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. All right. Go ahead, Mark. No, no, go ahead, Spencer. I was going to say, I mean, uh, what Congressman Roy mentioned with the guns, I think there's no doubt uh, who's going to be on the red flag list uh, if, if, these things, uh, if these things pass. It's not going to be evenly applied. Nope. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, next question is, I heard Newt Gingrich, Mick Mullaney, and Larry Kudlow talk about a spending freeze. Uh, do the congressman think this idea has merit? And this question comes from Dan Negria. Let me, so, let me just say, look, real quick, uh, Larry, Larry Kudlow can, can go jump off of, you know, uh, can jump in the lake. This guy flip-flops. Uh, I know he worked for Trump. He did Trump a disservice. He bragged. He's one of the reasons I got in my car on March like 26th and drove eight hours starting at midnight to get to the floor and tell them, no, you can't pass this bill without a vote. That's when they passed the first two trillion because Larry Kudlow was gl glad, he was glib that it was actually six trillion, not two trillion because we were going to loan 400 billion to the Fed and give them 10 to one bar uh, loaning power. So I'm sorry, I got triggered when you said Larry Kudlow. Uh, <laughs> you can talk about the others, but go ahead, Chip. Well yeah, I mean, look, the um, and, and I hear what what Thomas is saying. I think the um, what the, what the hell was the underlying question? Is Mick Mulvaney <laughs> and somebody else said spending? Well, the, freeze. oh, the, spending yeah, freeze. Yeah, is, so, is yeah, an idea. Yeah, is the spending I, yeah. freeze an, an idea with merit? Yeah. So of course, right? I mean, I've actually been talking in my office about a spending freeze, about what can we do to hold the line. But I mean, like, look, all it is is semantics, unless we have any kind of individual who is, or, or any kind of effort for us to get movement like we did a little bit in 2011 in the sort of Tea Party wave and cut cap and balance to force some sort of restraint. Um, I'm all for freeze. I'm all for, you know, cuts and going back a little bit and trying to shrink government and find a smart way to grow out of this. Um, you know, I talked about Rand's plan, there's others, but I would absolutely would say uh, do a spending freeze. Uh, but you know what's gonna happen? Our Republican colleagues are gonna come running in and they're gonna say, Ukraine, and we can't have a shutdown fight on September 30th. So they're going to say, we'll fund whatever you basically put in front of us. I'm just telling you, that's the way they're going to be, right? They're more concerned about legacies. Oh, Richard Sheldy's retiring and he's an appropriator. What, what can we do for Richard? I mean, you can't even make this crap up. But to answer the question, sure, I'm for a spending freeze. Um, but, you know, 
uh, you got to have pressure to get these guys to do anything fiscally responsible. Okay, next question is, uh, this comes from Kevin Patton. Why should anyone vote for any more Republicans considering that Republicans so often join with the Democrats in voting for massive spending bills? Well, I would tell you, uh, I mean, I have a hard time telling you to vote for a Republican that votes for gun control. Like if you vote Republican because you don't want your guns taken away and your senator or representative votes to take your guns away, then what good has it done? That is true. I would say this, uh, uh, was Mr. Patton makes a good argument for why you should vote in primaries yeah. and why you should get involved in primaries and why you should pay attention in primaries. And then if your member of Congress betrays you, then double down in the primary. Like primaries are so important and uh, probably more so than the general election. And I'll yield to Chip. Never, never underestimate the importance of weighing in on your members in real time. I have been a staffer Great and a point. member. As a Senate staffer, I was there in 2006, seven, when they were having the fight over immigration and members around the uh, constituents around the country were mailing in bricks and saying, don't do amnesty and all this stuff, melting the phones down. I've seen that happen repeatedly. Um, and members follow that stuff. And yes. frankly, your weaker members are the ones that are much more responsive to that. Yes, they, they're scared right. out of their damn mind. So right. if you guys call, they're like, oh, my God, I got 14 calls yesterday, you know, or whatever it is. <laughs> and so they freak out. So you should light them up and make sure they know that you're you're not happy with them and you should try to expand the zone. That being said, Thomas is right. Um, I, I'm with him. When, when, when there are egregious members, it's hard for me to tell you to go support them. But look, it's like everything else. If, if we're not willing to sort of walk away from the republic, then you've got to work through the system. You've got to go fight it out in the primaries. Then you need to beat them up in the general and probably show up and vote because the, you know, the alternative is pretty bad. I have certain there's a few Republicans I've refused to vote for over the years. But but it, it's also easy to do in a district or in a state like Texas where it's not close. So, you know, you got to make a judgment call. But what I my biggest message to the American people, especially great people of Freedom Works, beat their door down, make their you know lives basically miserable, making phone calls and, and telling them how mad you are at selling us out on guns, selling us out on spending, selling us out on open borders, selling us out on the climate agenda, whatever it is. Let me let me just say one uh, important thing to what Chip just said. Phone calls do matter. And he mentioned a number 14, you know, 14 calls in a day. 14 is a lot of calls yeah. for one congressman to get right. on one topic. Right. It almost never happens that you get 14. Now, you might get four. I might get 14 calls from uh, California in five minutes yeah. over my yeah, Christmas cares? picture. Right. But we ignore everybody who's outside of the district. And you might say that's not fair. <laughs> everybody p pays your salary. But resign yourself to the reality. There's only three phone calls you need to make. You've got two senators and a representative. Don't waste your time calling San Francisco if you don't live in San Francisco. Nancy Pelosi Wait. is not going to uh, consider your comments. Wait. Go ahead. Which Jay. Christmas card are you talking about, Thomas? <laughs> uh, I, just, I told my kids I wouldn't post that picture again. <laughs> <laughs> I might have curtailed their employment opportunities in a woke future, but uh, and they might get red flagged for me being their dad. But, uh, <laughs> oh, they're they're already red flagged for you being their dad. <laughs> That's okay. They know how to survive in a cruel world. But uh, I would just say, make three phone calls. Don't waste your time on the others. If you've got extra time, wait two weeks and call the same people again, and then go get your friends to call them. Because 14 phone calls on one topic in one day is a big deal here. And I've been on the floor, and Chip, Chip knows there are a lot of people go to the floor. Even Chip and I are undecided on some things. We go down there and we debate with each other. You know, this is a toss-up vote. And one of the conversations that we hear from our colleagues down there is, how many phone calls did you get on this issue? And <laughs> if their phones have been lit up, they just... They go down there and they vote a certain way. And Chip's yeah. right. The one, the weaker ones are more influenceable. So if you feel like you got a squishy congressman, you know, you can either, you know, cry yourself to sleep and wait for the next primary, or you can make polite phone calls. Don't cuss out their staffers yeah. and and be short. Don't try to do a filibuster and be polite and tell them your concern and you can actually influence them.
Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to have one last question. Um, this is from uh, Virginia Tucky, and this is, uh, is the Chinese manipulation of the supply chain a cause of inflation too, and how can we stop this quickly? Thomas, I started the last one. You want to go? Yeah. Um, I don't, yeah. There's so many, there's so many domestic enemies here of our supply chain that it's, that I don't even go out and look for enemies abroad. We're doing this to ourselves. Uh, yeah, the Chinese own our uh, one quarter of our meat processing capability and they, and uh, other things like that, but it's our own policies that are, that are doing this, frankly. And those, that's what's in the realm of control for me and Chip Roy and the 433 other people in the House of Representatives. So uh, we, could, we could fix our own supply chain here. We're not doing it. We need to focus on those policies. And uh, I'll yield to Chip. Yeah, I agree. I agree with what Thomas just said. I would only tweak that a little bit to say that our own policies, which are failing us, are in fact empowering China to screw us a little bit. And we ought to we ought to recognize that to a certain degree with respect to, um, you know, what Thomas just said, right? Owning a certain chunk of our, uh, you know, meat processing. Thomas's uh, answer to that is less to focus on China, but to just free up our ability to do it locally and take care of ourselves that way, and and with his Prime Act and otherwise. Um, and I think that's right. I generally agree with that. Um, but I do think uh, just look, you know, you have enemies. They are they are trying to take advantage of. Uh, COVID and put aside all the stuff with the gain of function research and all the things that are curious about all that, but they are trying to take advantage of all of that uh, and, and use that to their advantage. And we're helping them. I mean, we're, we're just saying, sure, we're going to make sure we're going to have nothing but solar farms and wind farms. So we're going to use your precious metals and things rather than, you know, drilling a hole and extracting, you know, oil and gas, which is our blessing that the Lord has, has given us. We're not going to build nuclear plants. You guys have 150 in the pipeline. We have two. Like that's the kind of stuff which Thomas is right. We're making our own unforced errors that are empowering our enemies and those who want to exploit that to beat us. We should have, for example, on our borders, we should have borders that are secure, but that we can then have a strong Western hemisphere so we can uh, push back on China rather than having China exploit the Western hemisphere and pump fentanyl into our country, all of those sorts of things. But we could win this fight like this if we just unleash the American people and have sensible domestic policies. We'd beat China and everybody else in the world. And, and one concern that I've heard is the Chinese buying up uh, cropland in the United yeah. States and also Bill Gates buying up farmland yeah. in the United That's States. That's troubling. It, it is yeah. troubling. But my first reaction to that is not to say, OK, how do we outlaw that? My first reaction is, why are the farmers selling their land? What did we do in this country that made it so hard for them to compete as a small farm that they had to aggregate into bigger farms? What regulations? And then those bigger farms are now corporations that don't have any vested interests in there. There's no family sentiment. They're not living on the land. How do we get to this situation? How do we undo it? And, it, and frankly, it's by undoing the regulations that have pushed us into this situation. Agree. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to thank you uh, both so much for being on with us tonight and give you a chance to have a closing statements. Um, Spencer, did you want to uh, close us out on, on the Freedom Work side uh, before we go into our uh, call to action? Sure. Well, I just want to say thank you to everybody for joining. Uh, we love uh, having these webinars. Uh, this is the second one I've, I've moderated, and I, I like uh, having, having conversations with people about the real issues that our country is facing. And um, it's so good to be here with, with everybody. We've heard about uh, the importance of calling your congressman, the importance of getting involved at the local level. And I think uh, Marissa will, will close us out uh, with, with a great message on that after, after any closing remarks from our, from our friends from the Hill. I'm just, I'm just gonna say thank you to Freedom Works. Um, there are a few organizations out there that can move the needle and Freedom Works is one of them. Uh, it's so hard to track what's going on in Congress. You need to get some uh, references you trust. You know, they give us a bill, they give us less than a day to read it, and we, we have to decide how to vote, and there are other members of Congress who are going to decide how to vote based on the feedback they get. So, you know, there's think tanks in Washington, D.C. that write white papers, and they uh, develop policies, and 
But the problem is they published that crap three months after the bill has already passed. And we, we need organizations like FreedomWorks who do the long-term thinking, but also can react immediately. So thank you all so much. Yeah, let, let me just reiterate, thank you. Uh, thanks for all that you do. Um, you know, uh, we're not gonna save this country from Washington. We're gonna save this country uh, from the people and from uh, those that are committed to freedom and defending our uh, God-given liberties. And that's, that's what FreedomWorks is about. And I'm a, deeply appreciative for it. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're going to the solutions come from people and civil society and helping your neighbors and building up local businesses and, and, and farming. And and it comes from our communities. It does not come from Washington. And all we do here is try to stop evil. And uh, we appreciate you all helping us from uh, doing it. Well, thank you so much for joining us. You are a personal heroes of mine. I am a survivor of domestic violence, and I want to thank you both um, for fighting the good fight to make sure that we stay protected. Um, and uh, just to add to the previous statements on that, I do believe that um, red flag laws are going to be the basis to create that social uh, scoring uh, that you both talked about. Um, and so I want to thank you for being vigilant on this. Thank you for being vigilant on our freedom. And, uh, and for all of those activists that have joined us, thank you for taking the time uh, to be invested um, in our freedom and in driving that. And so I want to uh, direct you to a new program that FreedomWorks is launching over the summer that I think our congressman will be very excited about. Um, we are building national infrastructure called Freedom Teams. And this will be a program to empower all of our activists across the country to organize, uh, to have the resources that they need to be effective in their local communities. So you can drive, uh, you can drive all of the action items that were presented uh, on our call today and so much more. And so we'd like to uh, invite you to join. You can go to freedomworks.org slash action. Um, and so this way we can build that infrastructure across the country so you can be effective locally, uh, but coordinated nationally so we can move that needle and restore freedom back to our nation. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. I, I was hoping to see Chip get pulled over by the police there in his car. No, no chance, man. No chance. I'm <laughs> Just kidding. You got to be driving to be pulled over. See you, man. <laughs> See you, brother. Have a good night. Thank you good so night. much. <laughs>